Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. I'm so glad you're with me today as we study together 2 Nephi, chapters 6 through 10. I want to start off with a few quotes from President Russell M. Nelson. They're all on the same topic, and as I read them, you'll probably think, I know what this topic is. First quote, President Nelson said, There is nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important. There is nothing of greater consequence, absolutely nothing. On another time, he said this, blank, should mean everything to you. Another quote, This is the mission for which you were sent to earth. This is the topic that Nephi turns to his brother Jacob and says, Hey, will you talk about this topic as well? This is in 2 Nephi chapter 6, verse 4, And now, behold, I'd speak unto you concerning things which are, which are to come. Wherefore, I'll read to you the words of, yes, Isaiah. So this is going to be good. They're the words which my brother, Nephi, desired that I should speak unto you. I didn't speak for your sakes, that you may learn and glorify the name of your God. And verse 5, I'm going to read them, and I'm going to liken them. I'm going to compare them to you, house of Israel, because everything that you do with Isaiah, end of verse 5, hey, they may be likened to you. That's why I'm getting this. I'm quoting this for you. And verse 6, thus saith the words, the lower words of Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and this is a prophecy of the last days, and set up my standard to the people. The standard he's referring to is the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And it has a purpose. And President Nelson's going to talk, you know, kind of one of his prophetic priorities is this purpose. Back to verse 6. Okay, set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their arms. The topic is that Jacob's asked to talk about is the gathering. President Nelson, now here's the full quote, with kind of everything kept in, my dear ex extraordinary youth, you were sent to this earth at this precise time, the most crucial time in the history of the world to help gather Israel. There's is nothing happening on this earth right now that is more important than that. There is nothing of greater consequence, absolutely nothing. The gathering should mean everything to you. This is the mission for which you were sent to earth. Or in 1 Nephi chapter 6, verse 11, as he's quoting Isaiah, quote, Wherefore, after they, now we're talking about scattered Israel, have been driven to and fro. Thus saith the angel, Many shall be afflicted in the flesh, and shall not suffer, be suffered to perish, because of the prayers of the faithful. They will be scattered, smitten, and hated. Nevertheless, the Lord will be merciful to them. That when they, okay, and I know this could be all of Israel, and, and maybe there's a specific focus on, on one tribe of Israel, the Jews, when they shall come to the knowledge of their Redeemer, they shall be gathered together to the lands of their inheritance. The key is coming to the knowledge of Christ is a gathering process. The purpose, of the, one of the purposes of the church, to gather all to come unto Christ. President Russell M. Nelson has noted. Any time we do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil to make and keep their covenants with God, we are helping to gather Israel. And, you know, I mean, if I'm teaching a class, I just say, so you know, at this time, I just say, okay, you're doing a lot of great things. What are you already doing that's helping people on either side of the veil make and keep their covenants? Hey, and what's then, then kind of moving it one step forward? What specific things can you do to help the Lord, others to come unto him, that guy, gathering on either side of the veil? So that, that usually has a pretty good discussion. So chapter 7 of uh, 2 Nephi, Jacob is going to continue reading from Isaiah. Now this is going to be Isaiah chapter 50. And Isaiah speaks about Christ, and I'm just going to focus on maybe right in the middle. That's where I'm going to start off. Because I love the idea, and it's a prophecy about Christ, and we're going to apply it to ourselves. The Messiah will have the tongue of the learned. He'll be able to speak like somebody who's educated, I think, mentally and emotionally and spiritually. Those type of learnings all combined. So, and, and this is one of my favorite quotes by Benjamin Franklin, and I know I've used it in other times. Benjamin Franklin said, Remember not 
only to say the right thing in the right place, but far more difficult still to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the tempting moment. I think about that as a, the tongue of the learned. You, you say the right thing at the right place, and you're being inspired, and you're giving a lot of thought, and, and, and it's heartfelt, it's real. But you also leave those tempting things unsaid at the tempting moment. I just love that phrase. So I'm going to skip to verse 4 of chapter 7 of 2 Nephi. It reads, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. Now, you do a little bit of different translations in the Hebrew. It also means the instructed, the disciple. God has given me the tongue of the instructed, the tongue of the disciple, the tongue of the follower of Jesus Christ. I love it. That, I mean, here's the reason why. That I should know how to speak a word. And, and I love it that this speaking is not just speaking, but it has a connotation that it's you're uplifting with your words. Or a Bible phrase, to sucker by words, to lift up with what you're saying. God's given me, instructed me, the tongue of a disciple of Jesus Christ. So I know how to lift people up in a season to him that is weary. weary. When they're weary, God's helping me to know what to say to lift them up. He, now that's, that's God. He's the topic there. He, God, awakens morning by morning. It's every morning. Each and every morning when I'm getting up, I'm having this conversation where God's kind of awakening me to remind me how to build people up by my words that day. To be able to say the words that he would say. So every morning, morning by morning, he, once again, back to verse 4, he, God, maketh mine ear to hear as the learned. It's not just that I know what to say, but I'm also hearing as a disciple of Jesus Christ what I should be saying. It's God who's waking him up, every, us up every day to be an instructed disciple of what to say because we're listening to him. And there's some things in that chapter that's just awesome that will help us in our daily discipleship to listen for God's inspiration. In verse 4, we have that realization that God can guide us every day, and we got to listen for it. We have to be willing to hear him. That's one of the messages of verse 4. And verse 5, something will help us listen daily for God's inspiration. And I'm just summarizing verse 5 is be obedient, be attentive to his voice. And then just summary of the next two verses, 6 and 7, it'll help us listen to God's voice if we know God will help us in times of our trial and persecution. We exercise that faith and we act. And really in verse 7, there's a focus. we got to have confidence. If we're going to listen for God's voice, we have a confidence He's there. And He will say something for us today. And then get this wonderful prophecy in verse 6. I gave my back to the smiter my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Oh, and I, I, I think of, of Christ as those last, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, his whole life, but specifically after he is taken, arrested for in Gethsemane, coming back to the Jewish leaders and smitten, and it's a little bit of, of shame, and I'm reviling you, a prophecy of what Christ is going to go through. And verse 7 for the Lord God will help me, therefore I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint. And I'll pause there for just a minute. A lot of times when I think of flint, I think of something that's a fire starter. Not very attractive. But flint can be polished. It can be gorgeous when it's kind of just looked at and just with a lot of variety. It's beautiful. And I think back that that the phrase in with Nephi, Isaiah says, I've set my face like, okay, maybe it's, you could say fire starter, because that's the first thing that comes to my mind with flint. But my face is set in flint's hard sedimentary rock. It breaks in a way <clears throat> that you can use it as a tool, a weapon, a fire starter, and when it's polished, it's valued. 
So I'm just trying to visualize that. I'm setting my face like a flint. I know I'm setting it forward. I know I'm, I'm, I'm setting it determined. But I like the idea of tool, weapon, fire starter, and valued. Because for me, when I set my face like a flint, I can be an effective tool in his hands. A servant of God who daily listens, from the verses ahead, uh, verse 4, to God's inspiration and acts on it is going to be an effective tool in his hand. They're going to be determined, setting their face like flint. They can be a weapon of righteousness and can light the fire of someone else's testimony in their heart and their mind. And I also, I also like that idea of being polished and just gorgeous and beautiful as we gain confidence in God and his word in our heart and in, in our, our ears grows. We become more and more polished. We become more and more valued and like a gemstone in the lives, I think, not only of God, because that, that he's helping us get that shine, but in others as we're building them up. Okay, I just love the imagery there of flint, not just as a start fire starter, but as a polished jewel, as a tool, as, as something that's also, I like it, the idea of the weapon of righteousness. Now, verse 8, I love the idea that the Lord is near. Hey, if the Lord's near, let's stand together. Verse 9, God will help me. And then verse 8, the Lord, I'm, I'm skipping to chapter 8, verse 3, the Lord shall comfort Zion. And I'm starting to see a theme here. Okay, God's going to set my face forward. I'm going to be doing him. I'm going to be a tool. But now we start to get in, in, in chapter 8 where we get words like, okay, comfort. We get comfort again. We get waste places and wildernesses. And then... It's desert in verse 8. I'm trying to visualize this. There comes a time where Zion, followers of Christ, this community of God, needs comfort. They may feel like, I'm in a waste, desert, wilderness. It is. Skipping down to verse 7. There's been some reproach. There have been some revilings. Skipping down to verse 12. Maybe the we really need comfort because there's some fears that we have. And that's, for me, a theme of chapter 8. People in Zion who have been trying to listen to the Lord, they've been trying to act on it. They've been trying to be that, setting their face like flint and, and be a polished gem and being the hands of the Lord and being an instrument in the Lord's hands. And they're getting a hard time for it. They're getting reproached and reviled. And maybe they feel kind of like, man, this is like a wasteland to me that I'm going through. I'm afraid. I need comfort. And as I went through chapter 8, I had that just kind of mindset for me. How does God comfort us? And then I started to see a pattern emerge. Words that are repeated. And if you want to know what's important to somebody, listen to what they repeat. And chapter 8, verse 9, you get this theme of awakening. The Hebrew word for awake is a call to, to action. It's a call to have a positive response. In Hebrew, Old Testament, when you repeat the word twice, it's an emphasis on it. It's an emphasis that you need to have a positive reaction to what the Lord is saying. So the rest of that phrase is Awake, awake, and put on strength. There's an image, you know, of the soldiers putting on that armor. They're getting ready to prepare for battle. Awake, as in the ancient days. There's a, hey, let's be thinking of examples in the past where they had to have a call of action. They had to respond positively what the Lord's asking them to do. And there's a lot of them in, in ancient days. Okay, you get verse 17. Awake, get that call, start doing some righteous action, and stand up. Okay, and then you get in verse 24, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments. And I'm going to come back to that, kind of the meaning of that strength and the beautiful garments. But I, in, in this chapter, there's some things where it just talks about putting on your strength and standing up. You can start to get those examples. I'm coming back to some of those earlier verses. In verse 2, Sarah and Abraham, great examples, legacy of faith. 
If you want to have righteous action, think about some of these great examples of faith. Verse 9, that awake wake is Rahab, where she wounded the dragon. Okay, um, in ancient days, Rahab, oh wait, let me, oh, I'm going to come back to my dragon in just a minute. Got to save my dragon pictures for just a minute. Okay, coming back. Put on your strength and stand up by, in verse, verse 6, by lifting up your eyes to heaven. In verse 12, you stand up, you awake and put on strength by don't fearing what other people are going to say, that peer pressure. There is a way to put on strength by singing in verse 11 and to hearken. Now, hearken, I love that, that word in Chinese. Chinese is ting. That's, that's what the Chinese word is. And Chinese is beautiful because it has different characters. And I learned this about the Chinese character for listening. I think it's just brilliant. So you have that top little, uh, I'm bringing my cursor over, this character right here, or this portion of the Chinese character. It's a sub-character. Maybe there's a better way of saying that. If you're in Chinese, you'll probably say, oh, Brother Miller, here's what it is. But this little character here means ear. You listen with your ear. And when you listen, this character right here, it's got to be king. It is... When you're doing this, you got that. That's got to be your focus. Is what you're listening to, and then you also have that. This character right here is. It's, it's got to be your focus, your main focus, your chief focus, your king focus, not only of your ear but also your eye. And then you got this character up top that it's a maximum or ten. Your focus is a maximum attention, and it's of. This character right here is of one single focus, and hopefully this isn't closed up or overshadowed with, with my shot of my head, but this character right down here at the bottom is a character for your heart. To hearken is simply to listen, to give respectful attention, to give heed to, to act with, with a singleness, with a focus. I love that, and that's one of the things, hey, you need to focus on Christ. So if you're afraid, you need comfort. This whole theme of this chapter, one of the themes, hearken to God, listen, act. Have that focus of your mind, your ear, your heart. Follow after righteousness. And that's a summary of a lot of the verses. Seek the Lord. Look to examples. You got them in the scriptures. You got them in faithful ancestors. And I told you I'd come back to the dragon verse. Okay. Awake. Awake. Hey, rouse yourself. Open your eyes. You got to put on strength. Now, the Hebrew, that root, is you got to be firm. So you rouse yourself, you open your, your eyes, and you're going to put on firmness. And then it's like, oh, arm of the Lord. Your firmness comes from the strength of, of God. Now, Rahab is, in literal interpretation, breath or the proud. And this was referring back to a Old Testament story of Rahab. Um, and Rahab in the Old Testament, Rahab is living in Jericho. And as the armies of Israel come into the area and they're looking, kind of send two spies into Jericho, let's kind of eye it out. The spies come in and Rahab protects them, saves their lives, lets them down at the end over, over the wall of Jericho. And she does it because... There's, a, there's kind of an indication that Rahab, whatever her past has been, she believes that Israel, their God, is God. So there's she's an example of faith. So thou art not cut, back to verse 8, art thou not he that cut Rahab or cut her out from wickedness? Aren't you the one that had the power to get her out of that situation based on her faith? And wound the dragon. Now, the dragon is a Hebrew word. It, it's kind of like a marine or a land monster. There is a connotation that it's it's like a crocodile. It's symbolic for wickedness. It's symbolic for Egypt. Okay? But have you put on your strength? Have you roused yourself up? Are you firm in the arm of the Lord? And have you cut out the pride? Have you cut out the wickedness? The Rahab is the example. And... Are, are, you, are you able to take out that dragon, that which is sometimes symbolic of chaos? Um, if we desire 
not to have our actions set us apart from God's kingdom on the outside looking in. We need to wake awake. Repeating the call to wake twice emphasizes the act, the need to come out from any spiritual lethargy and act. We are to put on the strength and the arm of God, that is, done through the Lord's atonement, which can save us. We should remember to awake, as in ancient days, when the Lord cut Rahab from the wicked city of Jericho. Rahab represents the proud who allow God to guide them back into the promised land. And I go off on a tangent here with the dragon because I just love dragons. I love the stories with dragons. I love J.R. Tolkien. He said this about dragons. It simply isn't an adventure worth telling if there aren't any dragons. Come on, some of the funnest adventures are dragons. And I know there's other there's tales without dragons. But I love dragons. Back to J.R.R. Tolkien. It does not leave to live a dragon. Sorry, it does not do to leave a dragon. Man, I got to do this a third time. Ready? I got this. It does not do to leave a live dragon out of your calculations if you live near to him. And then I go back to that whole chapter. Dragons, symbolic of chaos in scriptures, symbolic of Egypt, of, 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 an, of an evil. I think, what are some of the dragons? As I go through that chapter again, things are like can be compared to our lives, our dragons. The chaos that things happen in our lives. And in this chapter, Isaiah mentions fear, the reproach of others in verse 7, others reviling our wounds, whatever they are, emotional or, or physical, spiritual, our sorrows, verse 11. Maybe our dragon that brings a lot of chaos in our lives, difficulties is death or being oppressed, verse 13, or being captive, maybe captive to an addiction. Failures is mentioned in verse 14. We get this idea of the cup of someone's fury. They're mad at us. Maybe they're, it's justified, maybe it's not. And we get verse 19, just an imagery of desolation. Isaiah mentions a lot of things that could be our dragons, our fears, and God is able to cut us out. Because there are some dragons that are just really symbolic, and they're just desolation that's what they do in the in the in the storyline and there are things that maybe are desolate in our lives i love verse 24 awake awake put on thy strength o zion put on thy beautiful garments o jerusalem the holy city for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean and in march 19 or 1838 uh, Elias Higby asked Joseph Smith, hey, what, what does that mean? What's the strength? Put on thy strength, O Zion. The answer is section 113, verse 8, where the Lord told Joseph Smith. He had reference to those whom the Lord should call in the last days, who should hold the power of the priesthood to bring again Zion and the redemption of Israel. To put on her strength is to put on her authority of the priesthood, which she, Zion, has a right to by lineage also to return to that power which she had lost. President Ezra Taft Benson further explained, the phrase, put on her beautiful garments, refers, of course, to the inner sanctity that must be attained by every member who calls himself or herself a saint. Zion is the pure in heart. I love that imagery. And then chapter 9 made me want to go back to the chapters that uh, Jacob just quoted, and look at him again. I don't know if that ever happens to you where you look at it with a new lens. But chapter 9, verse 1. And now, my beloved brethren. This is Jacob at the end, like saying, hey, I want to do a summary of what I just read. And I want you to make sure that you got it. So verse 1. And now, my beloved brethren. I have read these things, these chapters from Isaiah, that ye might know concerning, man, covenants. Here was my focus. I wanted you to get out that about the covenants the Lord has covenanted with all the house of Israel. Elder David A. Bednar has noted, Covenants help us access the power of the Savior's atonement. And in covenants, we use our agency. We express and exercise our agency to accept the terms and conditions of the covenants as they have been established by God. In doing so, we give to God the only thing we can give Him, which is our agency. And in so doing, in essence, we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Then, and only then, are we free. 
And then, and only then, do we have access to the full power of the Savior's atonement. And only in that way do we really understand what it means to be happy. So I went back and studied, in my study, chapters 7 and 8 again of 2 Nephi, and thought, okay, in the lens of covenants, what is God promising to do? Because that's what Jacob wanted me to kind of be able to see. So you get in chapter 7, verse 4. Through covenants, God promises that he'll be able to help us say the right thing at the right time. And if I add uh, Benjamin Franklin's note, maybe to leave the tempting thing unsaid. Verse 5, through covenants, God promises to open our ears that we're able to listen and hear him. It's going to help us, verse 7, that flint, right, to be determined. Set our face like flint to be determined, not to be ashamed in verse 7. Through covenants, God's help promises us he'll be near to us in verse 8, that he'll help us, verse 9, that we'll be able to walk in his light, not the light that someone else is making that's like little sparks, but his light. And in chapter 8, through covenants, God promises, verse 3, to comfort us, to bring us into joy, like Elder Bednar had noted, and gladness, we can be found in covenants. Through covenants, we get, we receive strength from God. And it brings us a joy that we would not otherwise receive and brings us more holiness that we would not otherwise be able to have through our covenants with God. God promises also through covenants that our sorrow and mourning will flee away. Verse 11 and verse 12, I am he, yea, I am he that comforteth you. Hey, sorrow and mourning are there, but I'm there. I'm there going to flee away and I'm going to comfort you through your covenants. Maybe that's why President Joseph Fielding Smith talked about this chapter 9. As Jacob starts off by focusing on covenants, and that's going to guide a little bit of our, of our conversation in chapter, seeing back in 7 and 8 and through 9. President Joseph Fielding Smith said this about this chapter. One of the most enlightening discourses ever delivered in regard to the atonement is found on the ninth chapter of 2 Nephi in the Book of Mormon. It is the counsel given by Jacob, the brother of Nephi. It should be carefully read by every person seeking salvation. Okay, so you've just talked about covenants, and now you're going to say, here is the source of the covenants, the atonement of Jesus Christ. This is going to be our focus. And maybe for me, if there is one focus verse of the entire chapter, it's verse 7. Wherefore, it must needs be that there is an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs to have remained to an endless duration. And if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earths to rise no more. In a class setting, I would probably, probably just pause right here and just say, look, before we go on, we're going to focus on the atonement in chapter 9. An infinite atonement. And then I would just ask, do you have any questions about the atonement um, that you would like to ask? And when I've done, done this in class, it's been really, really fun to see what kind of, of questions they have about the atonement. So here's one class that was early morning um, a couple years ago. And they asked, hey, how can I fully access the atonement in my life? And that question I get a lot from uh, the class I teach with BYU-Idaho. And, hey, how does it use to comfort? Why do I need it? How can I help others understand the power of the atonement? How do I know I'm using the atonement correctly? After I'm forgiven, how can I feel better? So the focus of my discussion is, is really from verse 3 from Jacob. Behold, my beloved brother, I speak unto you these things that you may rejoice. And lift up your heads forever. So that's the focus of the whole lesson, is the atonement. And we may start off by just saying, well, let's make sure we understand how the atonement is infinite. The best uh, quote that teaches in kind of one short little paragraph or so about how the atonement is infinite was given by, Pro by President Russell M. Nelson years ago. He said in General Conference, His atonement is infinite without an end. It was also infinite in that all humankind would be saved from never-ending death. It was infinite in terms of his immense suffering. 
It was infinite in time, putting an end to the preceding prototype of animal sacrifice. It was infinite in scope. It was done once for all. And the mercy of the atonement extends not only to an infinite number of people, but also to an infinite number of worlds created by him. It was infinite behind beyond any human scale of measurement or mortal comprehension. Jesus was the only one who could have offered such an infinite atonement. Since he was born of a mortal mother and an immortal father, because of that unique birthright, Jesus was an infinite being. And according to eternal law, that atonement required a personal sacrifice by an immortal being not subject to death, yet he must die and take up his own body again. The Savior was the only one who could accomplish this. From his mother he inherited power to die. From his father he obtained power over death. And so this is the, the focus that, that through the atonement of Jesus Christ we can have that joy in our lives. And so we'll answer questions, and, we'll, and I, I try to do it from chapter 9 or lean towards chapter 9 where it talks about the atonement. Now, I also note in chapter 9, there are a lot of times where Jacob use, uses the word awful. And you got verse 10, the awful monster, and how it relates to the atonement, right? And forget it in verse 26, author, awful monster, death and hell. And verse 29, it's awful when you yield to sin. And there's awful, verse 46, fear and guilt and misery. And verse 47, there's an awful reality that he talks about. Now, there's three other times in the Book of Mormon where it, ta- where it uses the word awful. Awful chains in 2 Nephi 1.13. Awful consequences in Jacob 3. And awful dread in Jacob 6, verse 13. Chapter 9, as it focuses on the atonement, also gets kind of, well, there's attitudes associated and there's actions. There are attitudes that bring you closer to the Savior in verses 39 and 40 and 42 through 46. There's also, there's also attitudes mentioned in verses 49 to 52. And if, if I'm teaching, once again, this is a class, I'll have, you know, I'll be in kind of pairs and say, okay, one side, you look for attitudes or actions that bring you closer to Christ in these verses. And the other one, hey, what are some attitudes or actions in verses 29 to 33 or 34 to 39 that distance you from the Savior? And you know, after that discussion, I'll just say, okay, do attitudes and, and actions matter? Well, y- yeah. So if you had to summarize that in one sentence, how would you summarize it? And then maybe in one phrase, one word. And for me, there's one word that encapsulates this this whole conversation. And that word is smile. And and you get that in 2 Nephi 9.34, and you've probably seen this before. Spiritually minded is life eternal. The first words of each of those letters is to smile. And I hope you do smile. You know, we, we, we studied today some great chapters from the Book of Mormon where Isaiah focuses on covenants and how we're strengthened by covenants. And the real strength is in the atonement of Jesus Christ, chapter 9. That's our focus of chapter 9. Hey, thanks for uh, spending some time with me today. I would love your comments, your suggestions. I, I get some on, on the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for just letting for letting me uh, to know your feedback. I also have a... a Twitter account, well, an X account now, at Bro Miller's Notes. Trying to look at that at least a couple times a week. Uh, if you want to look ahead, I do have other videos for the Come Follow Me study that I did four years ago, and hopefully these are adding new and, and, and different content. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. I hope you have a great afternoon, great evening, whatever great day. Keep smiling.